you say the price of thy love's not a price that you're willing to pay you cry tears in your tears in your tears you I don't remember the words. Why so blue? Sad. Why so sad? <laughs> Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good whenever you're listening to this. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Is Fitz Happy? I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. Today we're discussing chapter 20, Jean Pei. And uh, kind of our introduction to the Mountain Kingdom culture. Right. A little bit more at least. Starts off with a kind of, uh, it's, a, it's an excerpt from one of the Mountain Kingdom's holy texts, it says. Mm-hmm. And it's basically saying that Jean Pei is a neutral ground. There's no enemies here. There's no strangers. We're all friends and neighbors and family here. It's a gathering place. Let them always be able to say, this is our city and our home for however long we wish to stay. Let there always be spaces left. Let words obscured of the herds and the flocks. It says that he finally understands John Pei after he re- reads this, like mm-hmm. years later. And the first time that he saw it, without this context, he was both disappointed and awed at what he saw. Yeah. Do you think the disappointment in it is in how his party is acting, or disappointed that it's not a big, fancy kingdom? I think a little bit of both. I feel like I say that every time that you... <laughs> ask me two questions it's a little bit of both it's fair (laughs) but uh yeah um i think definitely as it comes out later he is very disappointed in how the leaders of his party are acting politically Mm -hmm. and then also it's the mountain kingdom right and it's basically a big campground (laughs) sounds pretty cool like a hippie commune yeah yeah it sounds cool i don't know but uh, we, we get some descriptions. Um, there are large, very, very colorful buildings that are permanent that are either uh, for royal use or public buildings. Yes. And everything in between is a campsite, basically. There's temporary shelters set up. And everything is super colorful. It is as steep an area as Buckkeep is, so it's very layered and stepped up towards the top. And... Immediately when I was reading this description in my head, I thought of those fairly picturesque Italian uh, coastal cities, the hill cities. Interesting. Um, I I looked one up and I'm going to definitely not pronounce this right. But uh, the Cinque Terre. (laughs) Um. Yeah, it's C I N Q U E T E R R E. Kind of looked up. I kind of looked up a pronunciation, but I'm <laughs> not very good. Um, and I like if you just Google that, it like straight up looks like really colorful, stepped, very steep right. things. But I feel like you see that imagery a lot in um, in cities and movies and things like that. Not just Italian, but I know I've seen things in um, like Southern or Central America, just a lot of very colorful houses or buildings kind of stepped up. Right. And that's what I picture when I'm like thinking of this, obviously a different climate against a mountain. It's all white and pasture, green pastures around. But Mm. embarrassingly, (laughs) my mental image is a very another niche picture but it's of the houses in barbie fairy topia um <laughs> another barbie reference <laughs> shout out to the barbie movies for shaping me <laughs> as a human being um <laughs> but in barbie fairy topia um the fairies live in tulips and so because it's tulip shaped my mind mm-hmm. immediately goes there with all the different colors so i just imagine giant tulips in a field um but with snow instead of grass Except there wouldn't be snow right now, right? Because it's, like, technically going into fall. Yeah, so. and it, and they say that it's pretty green around it with the yeah. pastures right now. So, 
But for whatever reason, I always think of snow there anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, it's described as a snowy place in general. So <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that's fair. Well, I think maybe I think of the snowy imagery because... It describes it mm-hmm. um, by saying it is best compared, perhaps, to chancing upon a patch of crocus pushing up through snow and black earth for the bare black r- rocks of the mountains and the dark evergreens made the bright colors of the buildings even more impressive. So I think that in my mind just made me think of snow. Yeah. <laughs> but it is also beautiful wording um, mm-hmm. for how to picture this picturesque village. Yeah, and it fits also says that um, it puts him in mind of the fool's room, for in both places were color and shape set out simply for the pleasure of the eye. Because it mm-hmm. describes that there is a lot of art here, because there's a lot of extremely well-tended gardens, mm-hmm. and people that are visiting or staying for you know a couple months or whatever will sculpt living trees, carve wood, uh, do... St- stone sculptures or pottery creatures and put those in the middle of these gardens. Yeah. It's like a big city of colorful art and Buckkeep is very drab. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it's blue and gray, basically. <laughs> That's what Buckkeep is. And then yeah, this and is described as a lot of garish colors. Right. Which, I don't know. I love the idea that this culture, number one, focuses so much and so heavily on community and making sure everyone feels welcome and trying to accommodate all people um, so that there is one. And then on top of that, it lends itself to this culture of art. And I wonder if it's just because of the harsh climate that most of them live in that they then are able, I mean, what can you do in the middle of winter on top of a mountain, really? So, (laughs) So I guess you have to get good at doing something and art would be a great way to break up the bleak white (laughs) landscape. Yeah, that's true. Um, But I don't know. I just really like this more delicate side, I guess, of the culture that um, up until this point we have been missing because we've been told over and over again that these are barbaric people and that they're savages. And yet here is all this life and beauty and color. And it's so foreign of an idea to buck keep, which is kind of sad. Which makes me think that at least the duchy of buck doesn't really value art right very much and we get that like the tapestries are kind of old and there's not really new ones being hung up in buck keep mm-hmm. um there's not really artists spoken of ever there's only right. minstrels or bards talked about and i guess like song is a way to do it Mm -hmm. and get art out there but it's mostly stories or like kids bards that have like funny stories (laughs) puppet shows i guess puppet shows but there's no visual art really except for a really good scribe and that's more utilitarian because they're Mm herberies and it's not pictures yeah it's not widely available to the common folk it's an elitist Thing. Which also makes me think that Patience would have loved growing up in the Mountain Kingdom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she would definitely. have definitely flourished. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, their guides that brought them to uh, John Pei or escorted them there singing the ancient Chiyurda songs of welcome and, and teaching them the culture mm-hmm. brought them to a pasture. And... Then they urged them to go to leave all their stuff and go up to the palace. Right. But everyone <laughs> brought along a bunch of gifts and clothes and everything like that. And like, we need to bring our horses to be able to bring all of our stuff. Right. Well, they just weren't expecting to have to carry whatever they right. brought. Exactly. So they couldn't carry it all up, mm-hmm. up a big hill. Well, I'm sure they could have, but there are a lot of nobility in this pack, and I don't think they wanted to. <laughs> right, but think of, you know, like, everybody has to carry their own stuff, but then there are also all of the gifts. That's there true. There are three horses full of regal stuff. That's like, true. It's, Good point. <laughs> it's all of the, I mean, everything that they brought, I really don't think that they could have carried it themselves. True. Um, but there is a miscommunication there, and... Uh, the hosts are like, what? I don't really understand. So they're, they assure them to, uh, that they'll be right back. Like just rest, 
we'll be right back and then they come back with litters and uh, a bunch of young children to help them carry stuff right but also this misunderstanding is directly coming from august who is the head of the party or the standing head of the party and fitz notes that he did not handle this very diplomatically and that he's getting all but angry yeah at these people who are welcoming them as a guest at the thought of him having to walk. And I get that obviously it would be a lot to ask. (laughs) Hey, you have to scale this mountain after this long journey with a bunch of presents that you brought for our princess. But still, um, as Fitz notes, it's not very diplomatic. Yeah. He angrily explained that we had brought with us much more than we could be expected to carry into the city, and that many were too weary from traveling to relish the idea of the uphill walk. Yeah, and and then he also expounds upon the fact that Regal should know these customs and should have prepared everyone, and should have passed that information along. Like, you will be expected, like, they'll they'll mm-hmm. find you a campsite, and then they'll want to usher you into the palace right away. That's what a diplomat is supposed to do. You're supposed to arrange, understand these cultures, Mm -hmm. and then pass that information back. And then on top of that, because Regal hasn't done this, it now makes the entire party look boorish and unaccommodating. Yeah. And it just makes his whole nation look bad. I mean, there are people that Regal probably considers allies in this group, I would assume, and he's making them look bad, too, which is, in my mind, a bad idea. I mean, I don't understand the forethought of that, but I don't think Regal is as smart as his mother. So maybe he didn't think about that. <laughs> he just cared about getting the three horses full of clothing. And then... uh a stream of sturdy Chiyurta youths and maidens appeared. Uh, bears had been summoned to help carry the goods, and they brought a bunch of bright tents for the servants that would be taking care of the mules and horses. So they, like, provide them with, you know, labor to help carry stuff. They mm-hmm. provide them with housing. Yep. All because, like, there's this misunderstanding, and Regal didn't pass anything along, and it just makes them look so ungracious. I don't know. Right. It's crazy but um i really like that uh at one point fitz says i wished i had the courage to go to august and entreat him to be more adaptable to the ways of this people yeah we were their guests and it was already bad enough that the groom had not come in person to carry off his bride and it's really interesting to me i guess that number one fitz knows how to act in this diplomatic situation But, you know, number two, I wonder if that's partially kind of hindsight being 2020 or watching it unfold in an unfavorable way from a distance and being able to say, oh, that's not right. But in practice, would he really be able to do it under pressure? Probably. He's a pretty good people person. Yeah, I think he's I think he's pretty smooth with political maneuverings. Right. He's also very polite, which would do well in this kingdom. (laughs) But I don't know. So I think about that a little bit that maybe... This is a little bit of harshness towards his cousin, maybe stemming from the jealousy that he got to learn the skill unhindered. But also, you know, it's probably because Fitz actually would be better in this situation. And so they were um, walking up towards the palace and soon were met with a bunch of litters carried by Chiyurda women. Mm-hmm. and women old enough to be Fitz's grandmother. <laughs> so he was super embarrassed, and he thought it was going to be a humiliation to be carried into the city, but even more of an embarrassment to refuse. Right. Um, and he looked around and saw other litters in the city being carried, but those were occupied by, you know, the elderly or the infirm. Mm-hmm. So he's like, this is, like, super embarrassing. Yeah, which also... If they're helping their elderly get around like that, do you think that means that they don't actually have old people that go off to die in alone anymore? Like, that's something that used to happen back in the day, and now they've evolved, so to speak, to better care? Or if that was just a rumor all along? I think it, it happened in the past, for sure. 
Um, but I think they've evolved. We see with some talks with Prince Rurisk that he wants to have these trade agreements. He wants mm-hmm. to expand um, good for his people in every sense of the word, in every every edge of his kingdom to try and help them. So I, I think that they're becoming more progressive in their <laughs> in their health care <laughs> and helping and helping a lot of different people and, and being able to do that with more trade right and becoming i don't know wealthier or having the capabilities to do things like that but that could also be just in jampe and when they're not in this central city that's like the only permanent city in the mountain kingdom mm-hmm. the elderly could still take their self-imposed exiles right I don't know. That's just all I thought whenever I saw that the elderly were be also being carried in this manner. Right. So. Which also sounds really fun. You just get to sit in a little basket and <laughs> I don't know. Sounds cool to be an old person in the mountains. <laughs> it's his uh, pride is hurt. Um, he was raised by Burek to be very independent and be very prideful in right. what he can do. But He's also raised by Bjork to be very polite. Right. <laughs> so he can't refuse. Yeah. But also he knows that this looks so bad for yeah. his country and he's um pretty patriotic <laughs> when it comes to the view of his country at this point. Right. And I mean it says I set my teeth and tried not to think what Verity would have felt about this display of ignorance. And it's almost like Fitz kind of feels like he's Verity's representative. He's letting him down. Uh huh. Yeah. Which is a very interesting thing because I mean, maybe in some ways he is, but I don't think others would necessarily think that way of him. So it's right. interesting that he feels as though for his Verity, he's letting Verity down. Right. I think he's also. I mean, yes, he definitely is talking about himself there, but he's also. Talking about like a we, as in like we're all letting Verity right. down because this is all supposed to be for Verity, and <laughs> it's not a great look on a a husband to be. Right. Um, but he expresses interest in some of the gardens that they pass, and with that language barrier, that must have succeeded because um, his litter slows down. They let him time to look at gardens and. And kind of travel through the city at a more leisurely pace to really take it all in. Yeah. And he starts to converse with them in Chierda, very rudimentarily because he only was taught a few things by Chade. Mm-hmm. But he's really picking it up and he says, Fortunately, I had a quick ear for languages, so I blundered manfully into conversation with my bearers, resolved that by the time I spoke to my betters in the palace, I would no longer sound quite so much an outland fool. <laughs> and sure he has a quick ear for languages but mm. this was slightly quicker than normal as noted later in the chapter as well uh-huh. uh, because he grew up speaking this language yeah yeah and i'm sure it's one of those things that he didn't even think about oh yeah no and he just thought oh i'm good at learning other languages so that's why i'm picking this one up and i know a little bit from jade um, but it is really interesting to see this little bit of his past life kind of creep in, um, even if it's unknowing to hi- or unbeknownst to him. Yeah, definitely. We also get our first introduction to John Kui. Haas. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> and um, Fitz doesn't know it yet, but she is King Ayad's uh, sister. Yes. So the aunt to Prince Rurisk and Princess Ketrikin. Mm-hmm. She's so cool. I don't know. I just love her. And so it makes it even better that she's the one talking with Fitz and Fitz is like, I'm going to use this old lady to be better prepared for the royalty. <laughs> when I spoke, when I speak to my betters in the palace. <laughs> she's great. She is. And I love that whenever he tells her his name. Uh, she muttered it to herself several times as if to fix it in her mind because she wants to be polite and she wants to make sure. Although this could also be because she knows Fitz. 
I don't know. Might be an assassin. I don't know if Ketrikin told her. Later on, it says Ketrikin told Rurisk about it. Right. And I'm guessing they told their father, but I'm not sure. But also, John Quee's the one who comes to the garden for him later. And she also seems to know that he, spoiler alert, got poisoned. Yeah. We'll talk about that later, <laughs> yeah. too. But it, that's why I feel like maybe she might. She she's might trying to told. remember if. Yeah, I don't know. But I like to think that this is just a polite moment where this is a foreign sounding name and she's trying to remember it. Mm-hmm. And as someone who is horrible with names, <laughs> like. Feel the pain. Yes. And Same. <laughs> I love that she has her own way, like in House Bunny. For chivalry. <laughs> she could be like that. <laughs> and uh, has a, a cute little scene where he's at a... Persuaded them to stop at a garden. He gets off and takes a look at everything. And one of the women, you know, shows him how good s- certain things smell. And it's a, it's a great scene there. And they continue on up. And it, it just the description of this place is very beautiful in Fitz's mind. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a very nice, peaceful place. There's gardens everywhere. He, You can tell he likes it there right? quite a bit. I wonder if on some level it feels like home. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, mean, it must look familiar. I don't know if they ever lived in jean Right. We don't really know. I mean, maybe not because his grandfather was from Moon's the Duchies. Guard, yeah. But maybe they made pilgrimages up there. It sounds pretty pretty regular to do that with this culture so right it's possible that he's been there before yeah but they uh they went up further um has more descriptions of buildings looking like flowers mm-hmm. and then they get to the palace gates right i just want to quick say this also has um Animal Crossing aesthetic in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is also partially what it makes me think of. Always on your mind. That's true. <laughs> so they bring out berry wine and tiny honey cakes, and they let the guests wash themselves, and the the quote-unquote servants <laughs> change clothes, and mm-hmm. they look a little bit nicer, and... Then they all go into the palace. This is while all the luggage is kind of being transferred in and being settled for for all the guests. And then we get a description of the palace itself, which is a really, really cool building. I kind of highlighted this whole paragraph description of it. Basically, it's, it's organically grown, and then it has wood walls in between trees. The interior of the palace was as foreign to me as the rest of jean A great central pillar supported the main structure, and closer examination showed it to be the immense trunk of a tree, with the swells of its roots still obvious beneath the paving stones around its base. The supports of the gracefully curving walls were likewise trees, and days later I was to find that the, quote, growing of the palace had taken almost 100 years. So that massive tree was found. Mm -hmm. They paved around and up and over the roots and then planted trees in like a huge diameter around it and slowly grew the trees, bending them in towards the top to give it that tulip shape. Yeah. The closed tulip shape. (laughs) And it just, it's, and then like the branches were cut away and everything. I've seen, you know, purposefully grown trees in certain ways, but nothing in my mind has ever come that become that immense. Right. It just sounds awesome because he does. says it's about the same size as the Great Hall at Buckkeep, mm-hmm. with as many like fire hearths around and things like that. Yeah, I mean it's an incredible work of artistry and craftsmanship and patience and patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also wonder, I mean, who thought? Yeah, let's just grow a building out of trees. Like, like who had that foresight? And then also, I can't believe that generations, plural, of people took care of it. I mean, I kind of can, knowing this culture, but, like, 
still. <laughs> yeah, they. I mean, they don't want to cut down trees at all. Right. I think it's in maybe two chapters, maybe three. I don't know when. Maybe it's at, in this one. <laughs> Some sometime in the near future in the book, uh, Rurisk <laughs> is talking about the uh, the planks for the warships that Buck wants. Right. Um, and he says that, like, yeah, my father doesn't want to cut down trees similar to the old customs, but I don't find any harm in taking the ones that have fallen. And he wouldn't really right. want to do that. That's not this chapter, but it, it is, okay. I think is coming up. So they have they have a reverence for growing things. Right. And, um, I mean, it's obviously been instilled in them traditionally for right. hundreds of years. And... Obviously, the person who was the first prophet judge made a huge impact on the culture here. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, like, sparked the growing of this place. Right. And, I don't know, I just think it's really cool. Yeah. It is really cool. But it is incredibly open as well. Since everything is grown, um, Mm -hmm. and everything is pretty much temporary, there's a lot of, like tents there's open woodwork supporting raised tents so it's just like platforms with like a no bottom to a wooden steps so Mm. there Fitz is kind of lamenting that there's not much privacy for anything that he has to do with his mission yeah there's no like sneaking around here yeah there's no real corners (laughs) yeah to hide in he was shown to his chamber he dresses into the clothes that Mistress Hasty made for him. Mm-hmm. And once again, he reflects on the crest that he got, the new crest. Right. And he says, Perhaps Verity had thought this changed crest less humiliating than the one that so clearly proclaimed my illegitimacy. In any case, it would serve. And I just, he has such a low opinion of what other people think of him. I know, it's really sad. Verity gave him this crest, I can only assume, because he wants to give him a crest and like, you deserve yeah. something more than just like the basic, you're a farce, you're a bastard crest. Right. And also, Verity already said that he's his father's son, whether or not he, his dad actually openly accepted him right. and that he is related to the Farseers and mm-hmm. he is accepted and I think this was just more of a show of that after that conversation and especially after sticking up for Fitz with the two complaints he obviously cares about Fitz and sees him as maybe a son or may I mean at the very least his nephew right but in sort of a son capacity because he's watched this child grow in place of his brother. And it's just really sad that Fitz can't see that love or accept the that, love. Yeah, except that someone would think of him like that. Right. Ugh. Oh, Fitz. <laughs> Get it together here, bud. <laughs> um, But there's some uh, commotion and he mm-hmm. heads out to see what it is and... It's the start of the welcome ceremony. So Regal and August are standing before an old man flanked by two servants in plain white <laughs> robes. Oh, Fitz. <laughs> this whole section, I'm like, how oh, you dummy. <sighs> but again, like, Regal didn't tell them anything true. about the Mountain Kingdom <laughs> at all. That's true. Or maybe he told August what to expect or right. descriptions, but... But still, yeah. like context clues fits yeah like they're Please. right there <laughs> you've literally they look heard like th- siblings <laughs> i don't know <laughs> you've literally heard that their king is usually referred to as sacrifice or servant uh-huh. like- <laughs> oh buddy oh man so uh jean qui is there of course and uh he is asking her like hey what's happening and she's like oh our king is um you know, showing all of you his daughter, who is going to become your queen. Right. Which also, like context, context clues. clues. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to say that it does have little instances where she calls them sacrifice. Uh, and then kind of, uh, I mean, I think you call it, which I think is a really neat little yeah, thing there yeah. of 
two people who are different native language speakers trying to communicate. And I really like that little detail of, oh, that's not what you call it. I call it this. Like, she stumbled through this explanation with many a pause and many encouraging nods from me. Yeah. Which, yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> So my family had a uh, French foreign exchange student come to our house. Oh, this was a long time ago now. But like that language barrier, like he spoke amazing English and we didn't speak any French. <laughs> but still, like the accent, like the uh-huh. slight word choices, like all of that's there. And you just kind of like smile, nod, and like, yeah, yeah, you're doing great. Yeah, that's how you say it. Yeah. <laughs> Completely understand like mm-hmm. that conversation. Right. And I've tried to speak Spanish to people because I should know Spanish, but my we didn't really have to learn in high school to get an A, so right. um, trying to speak it, you're way more self-conscious about things, so I completely understand the little line oh, here. Yeah. It's great. Oh yeah, it reminds me of when I wrote my friend from Mexico a letter in Spanish, and she laughed about it. We were camp counselors together and she laughed about it and told me that I was at about a third grade level, but it was still really good. <laughs> and I was like, oh, geez, <laughs> year two of college level Spanish. And I'm at a third grade light- writing level. But it is, it's hard to learn other languages. Yeah. And I really like this little <laughs> little example of two people trying very hard to communicate. And then it uh, it goes into a description of the two servants next to King Ayad here. Um, Because Jonquy said, yeah, the the girl up there is my niece. (laughs) So Fitz is is like, I awkwardly managed a compliment to the effect that, oh, she looks healthy and strong. (laughs) What a weirdo. At the moment, it seemed the kindest thing I could find to say of the impressive woman standing so protectively by her king. She had an immense mass of yellow hair that I was becoming accustomed to in Jampe, with some of it braided up and coiled about her head, and some flowing loose down her back. Her face was grave, her bare arms muscular. The man on the other side of King Ayad was older, but still as like to her as a twin, save that his hair was cut severely short at his collar. He had the same jade eyes, straight nose, and solemn mouth. When I managed to ask the old woman if he too was a relative, she smiled as if I must be a bit dim and replied that of course he was her nephew. (laughs) (laughs) That's my favorite part. Because you know she's like, oh, he's he's not all there. Yep. He doesn't know. (laughs) To be fair, it doesn't really describe King Ayad, so we don't know if he's like all gray and white. He doesn't Mm -hmm. really look like them. They take more after um, the mother, whatever. Right. But obviously those two are siblings up there. Uh Uh-huh. And the boy's just a little bit older. And to be fair... the only people on stage are King (laughs) Ayad, Prince Regal, and August, who's standing for Prince Verity. Uh, Oh, (laughs) Fitz. But to be fair, he is expecting August to be an invalid, basically. And... Rurisk, you mean? Oh, right. Sorry. Rurisk. He's yeah. expecting Rurisk to be an invalid. Yeah, And so much. this strong looking man standing next to the king probably would not immediately register as like, maybe that's the prince. Because yeah. at this point, even though he doesn't trust Regal, he still isn't expecting Regal to have lied so blatantly. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um. King Ayad has an introduction here. He's welcoming everybody, basically saying that he is now greeting Regal as a prince instead of just the emissary for the king Mm -hmm. as like a representative here and then gives them a bunch of gifts, August and uh, Regal. Jeweled daggers, rings, uh, precious fragrant oil, and rich fur stoles. When the stoles were placed about their shoulders, I thought with chagrin that both now looked more like decorations than princes. For in contrast to the simple garb of King Ayad and his attendants, Regal and August were decked in circlets and rings, and their garments were of opulently rich fabrics, and cut with no regard for either thrift or service. To me, they both appeared foppish and vain. And it's like a really, like in my mind, it's a super interesting contrast. Mm -hmm. And... They're the worst representatives to have for like definitely (laughs) to be the front of 
<laughs> the six duchies compared to the mountain kingdom. I don't know. Right. Regal is like described as the most vain person, mm-hmm. except for Chade when he was younger. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. But yeah, it's definitely interesting. And it's interesting that even with these stark differences, Regal has managed to secure Ketrican as a bride for Verity. Yeah. That's definitely. what really sticks out to me is he, even though he obviously is vain, he still somehow managed to seal the deal. <laughs> he is intelligent. He is charismatic. He has the ability and the training to manipulate people. But yeah, it is kind of a miracle that they stayed okay with him <laughs> there right. for a month or whatever, two months. Uh huh. But also, it could just seem like a foreign. Maybe this is just how this group of people acts. And right. they seem. The. Jampe people seem very courteous and willing to give up certain things to and accommodate differences. Yeah, to accommodate cultural differences. They respect other people's cultures. Right. Um, and don't really question it. They just try to help as best they can. And so I guess there's partially that, but you got to think when everybody else arrives and these two are still but looking a little Ketrickin does trust Regal. That's true. Like so obviously he's ingratiated himself into the family there. Like he's been yeah. good at it. That's true. But also she is 18 and he's like 20 in his mid 20s. So Yeah, something like that. Mid to late 20s or something. I don't know. So it wouldn't be that hard. Not that she has to be naive because she's a young woman, but I mean Risk does call her spoiled later, so <laughs> true. And also, Regal is super manipulative and gross, so and handsome, and handsome. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> um, doesn't help. <laughs> and King Aod summons forward his male attendant and introduced him as Prince Rurisk. The woman, of course, was Princess Ketrikin. <laughs> um, so Fitz is like, oh, okay, well. <laughs> that feels great. <laughs> yeah, like, oh no. Um, and then he finally realizes who he's been talking to the whole time, and that the litter bearers were actually, like, royal extended family, mm-hmm. and that they were literally, you know, serving their people by doing this thing. Yeah. And then he uh, mentally cursed Regal again that he had not foreseen to send us more word of their customs rather than the long list of clothing and jewelry he wished brought for himself mm-hmm. <laughs> oh and she and john Kui beside him is just like yeah it's okay yeah you don't have to yeah you did you're... nothing to shame yourself yeah nothing's wrong and don't call me my lady just yeah. call me john Kui still it's fine and i think she understands that there's a little bit of a culture difference here and When he starts getting all flustered, she's probably in grandma mode, like, (laughs) oh, Sonny, (laughs) you're fine. (laughs) I don't know. But I like that she, you know, just is like, you didn't do anything wrong. It's fine. Just keep calling me John Quee. We're fine. And then the the gifts for Ketrikin come out, and she is um, decked out in... um, finely woven silver chain set with red gems to drape her hair a silver collar set with larger red stones uh there's a silver hoop wrought like a vine full of jingling keys that are the house keys for buck keep and eight plain silver rings for her hands and she stood still as regal himself decked her i thought to myself the silver with red stones would have looked better on a darker woman but ketrickin's girlish delight was dazzlingly obvious in her smile and around me people turned and murmured approvingly to one another to see their princess so adorned. Perhaps I thought she might enjoy our outlandish colors and accoutrements. I thought that last line was not in a positive note. But maybe I'm wrong. I think Fitz is really liking all the art and stuff here, so like he really and we know we know for a fact he doesn't like buckkeep fashion <laughs> he doesn't like fashion in general he doesn't period. like fashion in general so uh, <laughs> if but, he could run around in a loincloth he'd be a-okay <laughs> true 
He probably does run around in the loincloth <laughs> often with the night eyes. I mean, that's true. Um, but yeah, I. It's not super positive, but also like he doesn't think highly of Bucky fashion, so it just that's in his fair. head, it's like, well. I I also feel like Fitz is very critical of anything regal esque. If that makes sense, he doesn't like when people seem vain and yeah appear to be people who dress opulently right which is such a weird thing and he never seems to be bothered when the fool does it later i mean he's a little bothered but not as strongly bothered as he is by other people doing it i feel he's more so bothered by the fact that their roles are different Mm -hmm. they can't be just friends right and it's just such a weird sticking point for Fitz that I notice that he is just so weird about how people dress. And I wonder if it's part it's partly because he's always stuck out because he's not had very I mean, he's never had to want for anything, but he's not had a ton. He wasn't spoiled endlessly with fancy clothes. He had probably one or two outfits that he until he grew out of them he literally had two outfits until yeah. he was like or the pants were like four inches too short for him uh-huh. <laughs> and Beric's like oh you've grown <laughs> so you're gonna meet the king i guess we gotta get you something else right and maybe it's partially because he associates what being a man is with how Beric is and i'm yeah. sure Beric wears like the same outfit every single day although maybe he's just like a cartoon character where he has the same outfit. It's like 20 like, of them. Yes. like 20 different same outfits um, that he wears. Cause I don't think he would ever be like dirty and wear extra dirty clothes. I mean, to an extent because he works in a stable, but he does describe that. He like hasn't showered for a while and <laughs> Molly would tell him if he stunk really badly. Right. So, but I don't I know. feel like Beric, he kind of just follows that example. <laughs> I guess, yeah. But I feel like maybe this is part of it, that Beric is his version of a man, and so yeah. other men who are into fashion, it's just too much, and then women who are overly into fashion and jewels are not people he'd want to associate with because maybe he has bad experiences with those type of women being super mean to him because he is a Fitz and can't help them socially. And they probably um, were the ones who were in Queen Desire's court and Mm -hmm. they were just passively mean to him or something. Right. Uh, But also, reading between the lines, Beric doesn't really approve of Regal or how opulent he is or anything like that. True. We know that Beric scrimps and saves. He repairs his own saddles and and leather work and stuff like that rather than buying new stuff and Fitz doesn't really understand why but all of that like sinks into him like why is Regal spending so much money I see so much use for all this money everywhere else but now he has three horses full of clothes and we see that those little comments about all the money's spent on Mm -hmm. these clothes and things like that so I feel like that also kind of plays a part in it true I don't know it's just something that I noticed that yeah was super obvious here especially with that line of maybe she didn't mind being like regal is like the subtext that i was picking up i mean for the benefit of the doubt it could be just she might enjoy our outlandish colors and he was just speaking from her perspective that right buck's fashion is completely different than the mountain kingdom fashion and maybe mm-hmm. she would enjoy changing it up right that's fair that's a nicer way to look at it. But um, the speech was br- brief, and Fitz was kind of glad because he wants to crash and go to bed. But he also has to stick around and like report for Jade and mm-hmm. all that. And then immediately... <laughs> John Kui had obviously attached herself to me, and there was no gracious way to escape her company. So I resolved to learn as much as I could as quickly as I could about their customs. Fitz... That is so rude. <laughs> you can't get away from John Kui. She's such a nice woman and she is giving you so much information. Okay, <laughs> even if it's like my parents and they're like <laughs> showing me like, hey, this is like my friends. These are like things I do. And if I 
am exhausted, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I wish I could get away and go to sleep. <laughs> I guess. I can sympathize with him right here. I just feel like it's so... Ri- John Quay's been nothing but nice in this True. whole time, and True. now he's all of a sudden like... Ugh, what a bore. I'm attached to John Queen. Oh, I don't think he's like that. Come on. He's embarrassed for himself. He didn't realize like, exactly. she was royal. So he's like, I, I can't really get away from her to learn about customs. So I guess I'll have to learn about customs through her. Um, once again, he wants to try to uh, learn about things before stepping up above himself. Like he was trying out the language. But John Quee's first act was to just bring him right up to Rarisk and Ketrikin. <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> yeah. See, this is also why I think she knows. Because she's immediately letting them know who the danger is. True. Right? That could be true. It definitely is suspicious that the first thing that she does is kind of like go up. They were standing with August, who appeared to be explaining how, through him, Verity would witness his ceremony. Which is a great thing to explain. It's probably super confusing. Oh, yeah. Especially Uh, with somebody who doesn't even know how skilling works anyway. But he was speaking loudly as if this would somehow make it easier for them to understand. (laughs) I just have in my mind a picture of a loud American just trying to. Oh, my gosh. I know. It's. (laughs) Yeah. I've seen it too many times. But also it made me think of like. I have a deaf cousin and yeah. whenever he asks people, he tells people, you know, I, can you speak clearer? I read lips. They like speak for louder. Yeah. And I'm like, he still can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at fault for that, that too, though. Like, I mean, it's-, yeah. it's like easy to do. I think it's something in our, in our reptile brain that's like <laughs> loud means understand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it is very funny to watch people try to communicate with him and just, like, get louder. Yeah. And it's like, just enunciate your words. It's, it's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, it says that Jonquil listened for a moment, then apparently decided that August had finished speaking. <laughs> I love her. She spoke as if we were all children brought together for sweet cakes while our parents conversed. Rorisk, Ketrikin. This young man is most interested in our gardens. Perhaps later we can arrange that he speak with those who tend them. She seemed to speak especially to Ketrikin as she added... uh, Yeah, definitely. She knows. She knows. His name is Fitz Chivalry. August frowned suddenly and amended her introduction. Fitz. The Bastard. And those are... All three words are um, capitalized there. The Bastard is a title to him. Yep. Obviously pounded into him through Galen and and Regal because right. August was always polite to him as a kid. Mhm. But also odd. I mean, she did still call him Fitz Chivalry because he explained his name was Fitz Chivalry. Right. But I mean, that is true. And yeah. I think it's a weird like jerk thing to do to be yeah. like uh actually it's just fits uh oh, which the means bastard. the bastard in our tongue yeah. like okay <laughs> august chill <laughs> like <sighs> but i mean they agree with you ketrikin looks shocked at this and risk's face darkens um and then Rurisk kind of just switches completely to chierta turns sideways to August and speaks directly to Fitz. Mm-hmm. Just kind of excluding August out of the conversation because right. um, he doesn't speak their language <laughs> at all. He was trying to speak loudly in his own tongue uh-huh. about something. And he talks to him about his father, about chivalry. Yeah. Because it's a touchstone that, I mean, Rusk is, that's that's what he knows about Yeah. Fitz. That's how he knows who Fitz is. Yeah. But also, why do you think they get so offended for Fitz that somebody is calling him the bastard? I mean, we don't ever see this in Buckkeep. I mean, people think it's a little bit bad that he's called the bastard, but nobody really like... It kind of stuck because Beric is just calling him Fitz the whole time. And True. like Patience is like, wow. <laughs> <I> <laughs> I'm going to would... call you Dom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Like, a couple people are just like, whoa, okay. <laughs> they call you that, huh? Yeah. Well, like, Hod does that, too. It's like, oh. That's true. But I feel like, 
I don't know. They still do it, though. You yeah. know? I yeah, don't know. That's it's, true. And I guess maybe it is a little bit of a culture thing, but it just struck me as odd that this is the first time. And I mean, sometimes people feel uncomfortable with the name, but nobody ever really like. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's explained just, later in this, though, too, that uh, in this conversation with Rurisk, that while talking with Chivalry, he doesn't understand why Chivalry had to step down as king. So I feel like having an illegitimate child isn't really that big of a shame if you weren't married or were not in a relationship right. in the Mountain Kingdom. I just I feel like I get the sense that that's not that big of a deal. Right. It's really like... It's your kid. Yeah, it's your kid. It's whatever. And then you just straight up call him insults in front of his face and it's like whoa (laughs) yeah that's a little shocking like this is a member of the royal family yep that you serve under bud (laughs) yeah but um rarisk says like your father spoke of you to me the last time i saw him and this is kind of confirmation from a secondhand source that we like he really actually spoke about this to one of his peers Mm -hmm. to discuss this before we get to the point where um, Fitz reads the letters between Verity and, and Chivalry. Right. But um, Fitz is like, you knew my father? <laughs> I mean, he knew yes. that beforehand that he did, but... But it's still... I mean, it's one thing to hear that your dad had business dealings yeah. with somebody and mean? another for that person to say, hey, I'm really sorry your dad died. He told me about you before yeah. he passed away. That would just... I don't know. I feel like that'd be super different because now instead of just knowing him as like the royal chivalry, he knows chivalry. Right. Yeah. And it says that when our time of talking of like the passes and the trade stuff was all done, we sat down for a meal together and spoke together as men of what he must next do. I confess, I still do not understand why he felt he must not rule as king. The customs of one folk are not those of another. Um, And he goes on to ask, like, still, I think this is what he would want to happen to bring our close people closer together. Do you not think so? And Fitz is like, yeah, I think so. We kind of discussed this before, but this is brought to our attention, like, straight up again. Why do you think chivalry had to step down? Why he felt he had to step down? I think it was patience. Right. And that's why she has a ton of guilt. I think, like, he felt that it wasn't fair to her. I don't know. Because if he was here in the Mountain Kingdom, I don't think she would have been with. So She wouldn't have been with. I think he was thinking of her, though. Well, maybe partially. But I think it's more of what... More of what Burek said once in one of the earlier chapters that he had a penchant for punishing himself. Yeah. Even if it was really a punishment to others and he didn't deserve it. And Same I think thing does. Yep. <laughs> Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Um but I definitely think this was more of a self punishment. I think chivalry feels bad that he didn't know he had a son. Yeah. I think if he would have known, he would have taken Fitz and raised him. I have no doubt in my mind that that would have happened. Um, Well, maybe there's a small doubt because he was kind of young, I assume, when this accident happened. But I think he does feel bad that there's a kid out there who doesn't know his dad. Um, And then on top of that, He's been trying to lead this kingdom, and now this child who is a small six-year-old has to worry about being a target right. for yeah. assassinations, and that's a lot to put on a six-year-old that you haven't even met yet. Like, right. you just learned existed. So I don't know. I it don't... also sounds like a very fast decision for him. Right. You learned of Fitz while he was discussing these treaties, and then after the treaty discussions were done, he's like, I'm stepping down. So, I, yeah, I don't know. It's... Uh, Me either. It's I a- just wish we knew a little bit more about chivalry. We get hints and little little pieces here and there, but I wish we knew more about Rurisk and him. Right. 
I love Rurisk. He's so cool. He's really handsome in my mind. I'm just very taken with him. <laughs> um, anyways. <laughs> um, but uh, Fitz begins this like, I didn't know my father well, but I think he would be pleased to see. And then he was interrupted by Princess Ketrikin. And this is after August has left because he's been excluded from this conversation, gives a hateful look towards Fitz and then joins Regal's group. But if you notice, his face grew very still, and then he gave a smile of malice. So I think he was having a skill conversation with Galen. Maybe. But I don't know what possibly could have said to make him feel like he won that match. Right. <laughs> so. right. It could be. Yeah. I but maybe know. he's also just being a jerk. And yeah. I mean, obviously something he is capable of. So. Yeah, it could be skill conversation. That follows right after um, uh, the use of Chirita effectively excluded August from the conversation. So it could be just like he felt affronted and didn't want to show anything and then threw a hateful, like, grim smile towards Fitz. But it definitely could be a skilled conversation. I didn't think of that before. Yeah. Like, maybe uh, Galen knows that Regal has already told... Right. Them, that he is a poisoner and so it isn't going to end well in the long run but um, after he leaves Ketrikin interrupts that uh, sentence that Fitz was speaking and then says of course how could I have been so stupid you are the one they call Fitz do you not usually travel with Lady Time King Shrewd's poisoner and are you not training as her apprentice Regal has spoken of you obviously okay now John Quee is still there so yes mm -hmm. you 100% were right before that um Ketrikin must have spoke to like the whole royal family and <laughs> that was the that's why meeting. yeah and that's why John Quee kind of attached herself to them and then was able to familiarly introduce them mm -hmm. introduce Fitz to Rorisk and Ketrikin right away right um but Fitz is completely shocked by this and he's he's just like how how kind of him <laughs> well I think that would be a little bit of a scary surprise. Yeah. Like, Does, you think you're going to do a quiet killing for the royal family, and all of a sudden your target is like, hey, aren't you the one who's supposed to kill people? He says, inside me, for the first time, I acknowledged that what I felt for Regal went beyond distaste. All right, good. Yeah. Good, good start. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's kind of weird. I don't think... I mean, Regal isn't great to Fitz up until this point. He has never been a good person. But I think it's interesting that Fitz has, for a while now, probably felt more than just distaste. And I guess he's just so different from Verity and obviously doesn't have Verity's best interests at heart and is a terrible person. And I don't know. I yeah. just thought it was interesting that it this isn't the thing that pushes him over the edge this is the thing that makes him realize oh i actually like really hate regal i mean they don't uh, he doesn't spell out every interaction he has with regal right he's been having snide remarks and insults all right. of his life he sees uh regal disparage like verity and chivalry in mm -hmm. front of them yell at it's in front of the king saying that we should kill Fitz in front of the king right. and to uh, Verity and spending all this money and stuff. And I, I don't know. I feel like I feel like that's enough to make you hate somebody. Definitely, I guess. I, I'm, I'm just not really surprised that he has that feeling. I guess I just it would have surprised me less if this was. The thing that the straw that broke the camel's back rather than the glasses being put on the eyes could be just another way of saying it basically i it's guess like one more it could have been anything but another thing it's just like wow okay yeah. he really i really do feel this way about him and he feels that way about me great yeah. um but uh Rurisk frowns a brother's rebuke at ketrikin and then turn to deal with the servant um Rurisk is a very tactful and political minded and diplomatic person just like chivalry was yep 
he doesn't want to deal with people bluntly and just like say oh this is what we know <laughs> and like see how they react like he's, he's like shrewd in that way where it's keep your information until you can deal with it properly yep Instead of impulsive 18-year-old saying, hey, aren't you that poisoner that's going to come kill my brother? <laughs> also, I, lo- I love the idea that the way he's handling this maybe st- uh, says that he doesn't fully trust Regal. And I like to think he's smart yeah. enough to know that Regal's trash. But I mean, him and Chivalry were friends. I'm sure they had discussions about, like, right. maybe not full internal politics, but just got a general feeling. Right. You well, know. and also he knows chivalry, and then to meet Regal afterwards. Yeah, I mean Regal is a good politician in a sense. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's the same new no. in no. any way <laughs> since no, our no, no. with chivalry. He wasn't as perfect as chivalry yeah. for sure. Um, but uh, Ketra King kind of pulls him out of his stupor, basically of like, oh my god, what happened just yeah. now? And she's like, oh. You want to see the gardens? They're this way. Come on, let's let's go. And um, I understand that many of you were too weary to even walk into the city. So if you wish to retire, you can. So there's there's that miscommunication uh-huh. when August was like, oh, we have a lot of stuff and a lot of people are really tired and they don't really want to carry all of that stuff uphill right now. They understood it as all of our people are way too tired to walk. So now they sent a bunch of litters down. Uh-huh. And it's just kind of uh, a little thing I caught on this this reread through. It was kind of kind of funny to, to to listen to and connect those dots. But um yeah, so it's is kind of trying to be like polite like yeah, I want to see the fountains in here and stuff, but uh she's like, "Okay, we'll we'll go to the gardens first this way." And as they're walking out, Fitz sees that August was watching them and that Regal turned and said something in an aside to Roud. And then Fitz wondered why Roud was even there and hadn't remained with the horses and other servants. Mm -hmm. What do you think that instruction was? Because I don't think Roud follows them. Mm -hmm. I think they're way too observant for Roud to do that. And Roud's a big guy and not really like stealthy as far as we know. Maybe that's how stealthy he is. Ooh. Fitz doesn't even know he's being followed. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I think it's it could just be a nasty comment because Regal is want to make those. Um, but I am more inclined to think it's instructions to watch Fitz and make sure he doesn't ruin the months of work he's had with Ketrickin. Right. Make sure that he stays here. <laughs> yeah. Basically, like at some point off him. Yeah, that's yeah, that's probably right. Which do you think that was his plan all along? To make Fitz out to be the bad guy. Potentially Fitz gets his work done, but then he can kill Fitz and win over the favor of the kingdom because he killed the killer of the king. Yeah. Hundred percent. Mustache twirling mastermind plan laid out <laughs> like hoo, 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 I will steal away my brother's bride by killing the older brother. Of that said bride and getting rid of my least (laughs) favorite nephew, (laughs) my least favorite nephew Hmm. and a thorn in the side of the the whole royal family. Two birds with one stone and I am that closer to the throne. Okay, this makes his plan make a little bit more sense to me. Before I was like, why would you tell people he's an assassin? Like that, again, is ruining your Standing, your country's standing in these people's eyes. Ruins his country's standing, but not his own standing within their eyes. Because he's yes. the one who warned, quote, warned them of it. Mm, right. So he would still have high standing in Ketrickin's eyes to be able to steal her away later. Fair enough. Okay. It's all Regal's about, not as dumb as I thought. It's all about their own family. <laughs> it... Their own half of the family, I should say. But literally, he just, like, doesn't care about anyone in his family and is like, deuces, I'm going to take over this whole kingdom yep. and kill everybody and their reputations in the process. Because he's better than them, obviously. More royal than them. Apparently. Um, but they're outside. And Ketrickin and Fitz have a nice conversation. 
and belatedly it says that it's didn't notice any signs of illness on Prince Rurisk. Mm-hmm. So he's outed as a poisoner. No signs of weakness in Prince Rurisk. He's like, oh, something's kind of up. But I yeah. can't think of anything because I don't know what to do right now. <laughs> also, I'm like 15 and yep. this is the first time I'm on my own and can't contact my king to ask what I should do. Yep. Um. So he pulls his thoughts away from that but and tries to... You know, give his full attention to Princess Ketchikin. And they're speaking to Yurta. Mm -hmm. And he's fairly fluent in it right now. Right. And also, he constantly has to remind himself that she was a princess Mm -hmm. and betrothed to Verity. I had never encountered a woman like her before. It's his crushing. Oh, yeah. It's crushing hard. Which, okay. It was recently brought to my attention that people ship... Uh, yep, I do. Fitz and Ketrikin together. I never even saw them as a possibility, and I'm Mm-mm. very. Obs- I mean, like obviously he thinks she's cute, but like I think they're like a perfect match, just at wrong places, wrong times. Like what happened needed to happen and stuff, and they right. weren't at the right places in their lives. But like, come on, Fitz. Like older Fitz and Ketrikin. Never in my mind, not even once, was I like they're only like three years apart. They should get together. They <laughs> like I think they're cute, and I know Night Eyes wants them to be together. But like, I think after hearing that uh, Luke and I talking about that a little while ago, and then reading like how smitten he is with her mm-hmm. when their first meeting, I'm like, oh, how did I not notice this? this is so good. <laughs> they they discuss a lot of things here and he gets to learn a lot more about her and she is very enthusiastic about gardening knows a lot about herbs because she's expected to Mm -hmm. she's very competent she likes to smith silver in her like free time and that's probably also why she was very excited to get a bunch of silver jewelry yeah worked silver she can probably appreciate the craftsmanship yeah um she knows falconry and horses like any stableman, it say, says later. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different things here. And it's like describing exactly what Fitz kind of said to Molly was like a good one. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and he then starts to compare her to the women, the two women in his life that are most important. Yeah. Patience and Molly. And he says that in a way she was like patience without her eccentricity. In another way, she was like Molly, but without the callousness that Molly had been forced to develop to survive. I found myself thinking that Verity might find this woman more to his liking than he expected. Ugh. He's really smitten with her. I'm yeah. a little a little salty about it because I really like him and Molly together. But also, <laughs> like, Ketrickin's really cool, so I can't be that mad. <laughs> But it also was a little rude of him to be like, I've never met another woman like her after knowing Molly his whole life. So, (laughs) but I guess he meant more so of a noble woman. Yeah, true. And someone his own age, not just Patience, who is a little weird. Yeah, true. In a good way. Um, But it also describes that Verity's taste is pretty much the exact opposite of Ketrikin. Mm Mm-hmm. Small, round, and dark, often with curly hair and girlish laughter and tiny soft hands. And he's like, what, would he love her? Or, like, I know he would respect her and uh-huh. is respect enough for a king and queen to have. Right. Which, yeah, I mean. I think in a... They learn to love each other through that respect. Right. And also, that's starting on the basis of respect is a lot better Oh yeah. than, like... Okay, fine. Could be, like, <laughs> but also, um, hey Verity, hit me up, you know. <laughs> wow, two men this chapter. I can't help the Rursk and these... Verity going after the princes, huh? You know, mm. sometimes royalty is just cute, you know. <laughs> um, in the midst of all of this, she is showing him the gardens. And showing him, you know, a very enthused, like, oh, try some of this root here. You can taste the tang. Um, and then showed me a certain pungent herbs for seasoning meat and insisted I taste a leaf of three, each of three varieties. For though the plants were very similar, the flavors were very different. And those three leaves are the poison. Yep. 
at the start of the next chapter, we get a little header, and I mean, we can talk about it again in next episode, but it's super relevant right now because it's literally what, a sentence, two sentences, and that line is, of the Chiyurdan herb carry me, they're saying is, quote, a leaf to sleep, two to dull pain, three for a merciful grave. So it doesn't season meat. It's used no. for medicinal reasons. Uh-huh. And she feeds him three leaves for a merciful grave. Yeah. Which feels like a little harsh, especially because she hasn't even really talked to him yet. I feel like she's really jumping the gun on that one. And I get that, like, her brother's in danger, but she couldn't wait, like, 30 more minutes. They got three days slash months she could have killed him later. Like Best time to do it right now. I guess. Before he has a chance to do anything. I guess. But it just <laughs> feels like she really pulled that trigger quick, you know? <laughs> yeah. So Fitz is now poisoned. Mm -hmm. He is going to die. Unbeknownst to him. Soon. Which is odd because you'd think he would know more about herbs. And just with his training. But it's a Chiyurdan herb. That's true. It's specific to this area. And he doesn't know everything about it. Like, I mean, yeah. he doesn't know about the specific herbs. This was two specific regions, like uh, right. later in the Out Islands. The mm -hmm. Delvin Bark is completely, right. like, way more, um, way more deadening than just Elven Bark is for the skill. Mm -hmm. He does, doesn't know some of the properties like that. And then the conversation turns to Verity. As it naturally would. And Fitz is asking, like, did Regal tell you much about Verity? And Ketrikin gets really quiet. I sensed her drawing on her strength as she replied that she knew he was a king in waiting with many problems facing his realm. Regal had warned her that Verity was much older than she was, a plain and simple man who might not take much interest in her. And this is of particular note, this next sentence. Regal had promised to be ever by her, helping her to adapt, and doing his best to see that the court was not a lonely place for her. He is literally grooming her into being his own bride. Yeah, it's really gross and predatory. Yup. But also, Fitz is like, that's not... <laughs> True. Like, By the no. way, how old are you? 18? Okay. Verity's 32. Yeah. <laughs> like, Which... it's not, it's, it's, okay, 14 years difference, sure. Yeah, but like. It's, it's weird. No, I don't like an 18 year old having a relationship with a 32 year old because you're still kind of a kid. Yeah. I don't like teenagers getting with people. Hey, that's much older than back in the uh, medieval times. So You know, I heard that's a fallacy. And oh, that really? actually in medieval times, people usually, like, in name were married at, like, 13. Yeah. But weren't expected to, like, start bearing a child until their later teens or early 20s. 18? Well, okay, <laughs> yes. But I'm saying, like, we think of yeah, yeah. old royalty, like, they those old men married 13-year-olds, but not necessarily the case. Okay. But, I but, mean, it's still, still... 14 years is not unheard of. Right. And it's not the very old man that Regal was preparing her no. to meet. And, I mean, this is also a fantasy world in medieval-like times, yes. so it's not normal everyday settings. Verity didn't seek her out because she was young but and i mean later we have biric and molly right who like love each other which also is a little yucky but that's super weird yeah because <laughs> i they're don't like, like it <laughs> i mean like later when they're older like i feel like it's it would be different if she like was over 20 years apart <laughs> right but like if if ketrickin was 28 and verity was 43 zero problems i don't care like it's just like when you're a teenager, so <laughs> it just like weirds me out. I don't like it. Royal and, like, marriages, you gotta be sold off to I the know. best alliance. And you know, some people, it's not as bad, but ooh, I don't know. It just worries me. So, um, yeah, Verity is 32, is gonna be 33 in spring. Mm -hmm. um, and 
she was all prepared to be sacrificed in this way to be like kind of sold to a disinterested old man who right. didn't care about anything which also she's gonna see him yeah i know it's like <laughs> but i mean it uh Ooh, that's it true. didn't recognize him at all like he looked okay. like a doddering old man touche touche although i don't know how but, regal would know that and and also <laughs> A doddering old man to a 14 year old like i yeah. remember when i was 14 i thought 30 was ancient and now I mean, i'm she's like 18 like she's not gonna think that much differently i suppose but i don't know i feel like the older you get the more you realize 30 is not old at all <laughs> and so <laughs> so i don't know but also like super weird that yeah. regal is just like disregarding the fact that she's gonna actually meet well he's just Charity. Been- He's manipulating her into having those thought, the preconceived notions, and it's just shading her whole idea of Verity. I guess. If Fitz never came in and spoke well of Verity, like, she would be going into this with a whole different perspective and, like, idea of who Verity was, and that's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy right. there. Like, if you're going into... Uh, a certain situation and you're going to think the worst of it you're going to think that everything that comes out of it is pretty bad i guess yeah. if you have hope for it you know you might see more good things in it that's that's a good point i guess but also i feel like i don't know they would have had to talk unless regal's whole plan is to like get the red ships to attack even more so that he can't leave the tower at all to be with her because yeah. he knows that his duty to the people is more important to him than yeah. wooing his wife. Right. So I guess that could also be part of the plan of like just keep them apart as much as possible. I mean, when she does come back, like Verity is pretty occupied and he doesn't really spend any time with Ketrikin. Right. So, but yeah, uh, Fitz kind of explains like, yeah, there he's not that young and he loves to laugh. He, he has great light in his eyes he loves to hunt with his wolfhound. He he has fun. He's not a dour old man who isn't interested in anything except for ruling. He has a bunch of life to him. His eyes shine. Mm-hmm. He d- describes him physically. He, but he does make concessions that, yeah, he's, you know, occupied with fighting the red ships right now. Well, and also Ketrickin stops fits in the middle of his describing of him to say well surely this is how he used to be right regal's talking of how he is now and fitz has to go well sure maybe right now he's a little worn down bent down as a tree burdened by snow that springs erect again with the coming of spring and then he does tell her that verity wanted fitz to speak well of him which i think is a good thing to openly say but i think you can also tell when somebody is like saying good things because they were told to and saying good things they believe yeah um and from this she ketrickin says i see a different man when you speak of him she paused and then closed her mouth firmly forbidding herself the request i heard anyway i have always seen him as a kind man as kind as one lifted to such a responsibility can be. He takes his duties very seriously and will not spare himself from what his folks need of him. This it is that made him unable to come here to you. He engages in a battle with the Red Ship Raiders when he couldn't fight from here. He gives up the interests of a man to fulfill his duty as a prince, not through a coldness of spirit or lack of life in himself." She gave me a sideways glance, fighting the smile from her face as if I, what I had told her was the sweetest flattery such as a princess must not believe. Which it is to her. Right. He's being a sacrifice for his people. She understands this. Yeah. She now knows that he's somebody... Who has the same ideals, if not the same words. Right. And they're probably going to be kind of compatible. Yeah. And it's true. And also... I like that Fitz knows that she's probably going to be worried. I mean, he is older. Even if 33, 32, 33 isn't that much older, he's still an older man that he she's getting forced into marriage with. Right, yeah. Who is this? Per- like, does she have to fear for her safety? She's a young woman. And 
Fitz knows and is able to say with certainty and without lying that Verity is a really kind guy and he's not going to hurt you or probably force you into doing anything you don't want to do. And I think that's like the best news he could have given her Mm -hmm. on top of that, letting her know that not only is he a kind person, but he has the same values as you and your people. Mm hmm. Even if he inadvertently says it that right. way. And also it kind of goes to show that Fitz is perceptive mm-hmm. in conversations. Because um, sometimes he can be really obtuse about <laughs> things. But he can pick up on things like, you know, close her mouth firmly, forbidding herself the request I heard anyways. Like right. With the wit, he is so perceptive in those, you know, one-on-one situations mm-hmm. to really also be manipulative a little yeah but i don't think he's the same manipulations that we all do in our day-to-day conversations and just like pick up on little cues and and social Mm -hmm. things but like sometimes fits can be so dumb (laughs) and so blind to things that it's great (sighs) to see his expertise in that he's been trained in right being political being um tactful and even if he didn't get a ton of training diplomatic yes in a way to speak to people and get them to come around to what he's saying right and it also makes me sad to think of how amazing he could have been as a diplomat if chivalry would have stayed in power and accepted him as the heir oh my God. he would have been the wit? amazing yeah. he could have been a force to be reckoned with And it's sad that that was taken from him because I really think it's a missed opportunity. And I I do like seeing this gentler side of him that is Mm -hmm. less idiotic. Right. (laughs) Um, But he also seems to do better for whatever reason, one on one with girls who women who are distraught it's like yeah almost like <laughs> distraught animals he's been taught to soothe yeah. and so <laughs> women in his mind are like similar and in, in that vein and he's like all i gotta do is calm him down it's good <laughs> and he stops thinking so hard on like etiquettes and he's just himself which is a very nice human being he gives a very nice description of his uncle and then Ketrickin says, you give me heart, and then straightened herself as if she had admitted some weakness. Why does Regal not speak of his brother so? I thought I went to an old man, shaking of hand, too burdened by his duties to see a wife as anything other than another duty. Perhaps he... I began, and could think of no courtier's way of saying that Regal was frequently deceptive if it gained him his goal. And for the life of me, I had no idea what goal might be served by making Ketrickin so dread Verity. And we've already discussed what reasons it could be, but, right. I mean, kind of spelled out. It's to make Ketrickin like Regal more than Verity. So when in the future, when Verity is out of the picture, she will easily become Regal's wife, and he can still have the seven duchies with right. the Mountain Kingdom. Right. And she goes on to explain that, like, maybe he's been unflattering about other things. Okay, there was this night that Regal and I had dinner, and then later clarifies that it was a solo one-on-one dinner that mm-hmm. he had asked to get to know her better again. Where he gets super drunk, which, yeah. uh, not classy, Regal. Not no. a great date. I mean, he's not very classy. No, he is, he's also an addict, so, well, like yeah, his mother. Yeah, very similar to his mom. But, like, still, you're trying to woo a woman, and you take her on a date, and then you get drunk and start ranting about <laughs> your family members you don't like. Like, yep. bleh, zero out of ten, never go on that date again, call an Uber girl. But, for whatever reason, she still likes him. <laughs> He told tales of you, then, saying you had once been a sullen, spoiled child. Sullen, yes. Spoiled, no. Too ambitious for your birth. Fitz didn't really know anything about that. (laughs) Uh, But that since the king had made you his poisoner, you seemed content with your lot. True. He said it seemed to suit you, for even as a boy you had enjoyed eavesdropping and skulking about and other secretive pursuits. Regal does not understand kids. No. In any sense of the word. (laughs) And when Regal has seen Fitz, it's when Fitz was underneath the table 
in the Great Hall at like 9 a.m. <laughs> with dogs feeding them food. Right. And like Regal's like, oh, you're spying. Yeah, but also <laughs> it kind of shows just how paranoid they are. Yeah. How there's just this delusion that has been fed to him. Yeah. And he, he's been like, brainwashed too. He sincerely believes this. I don't think he's making this up for the sake no. of Ketrican. I think he truly 100%. believes that Fitz, the boy who had to sleep in a horse's stall for was was sleeping in a horse's stall Prefers when he met him. a horse's him, stall. <laughs> yeah, is a spoiled rotten child who reaches too high. Yeah. And I just I know it's his mother's doing and this is kind of what makes Regal a little bit sympathetic when I really think about it. A tragic villain. That he <laughs> doesn't have a chance. He his mom made him this creature. Granted, he's an adult and can choose to learn from his mistakes and become a better person and he chooses not to do those things. But he also is taught this it's indoctrinated into him and he truly believes these lies he's been told. He's surrounded by people who feed those lies. Yes. Galen, I, his servants, like he feeds them mm-hmm. and they're not going to help him like No, they're yes men. Yeah. Because they don't want to die, like <laughs> right. which is understandable, but it's just it does make me feel a little bit sad for Regal that this is his life. Like yeah. this child has weighed this much on his mind i don't know yeah and then it says that ketrickin says that the next day regal begged me to believe it had been the fancies of the wine rather than the facts that he had shared with me um do you think that this whole thing was calculated was he really drunk did he really mean to spill those secrets that way was he lying the whole time that he was like faking (sighs) see in my head, I I have a clear picture of what I think happened, but I don't. I like to think, I like to think that Regal is one of those people who has kind of a goal that they want to achieve, but not really a set plan on how to achieve it. And then after the fact, if he messes up, he can scramble and figure out a way to fit it into the plan that's not necessarily that every little step of the way has been fully thought out and planned like the idea that she's gonna meet verity at some point and he doesn't necessarily know that he looks the way he does but i don't know i just i'm not sure yeah i think he took pleasure in getting drunk and saying those things. Right. I think he gets drunk or high on smoke every every night there. And I think like in his plans he needed to re- he he knew he needed to reveal that Fitz was the poisoner in some right. way. And this was the most convenient excuse for him. And also like I don't think even if he did plan to do it this way, I don't think that means that he doesn't believe the things he's saying. Right, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. He. I mean, he definitely believes them, like we talked so, about yeah. already. So. so maybe this was... Pl- I don't think he was fake drunk, though. No, me either. I think right. he took pleasure in getting drunk and then ranting about fits. I think he's a lot like his mother in that way, where yeah. he uses substances kind of as an excuse to like rant about the things that are bothering yeah. him. I don't know. Um, But Ketrickin gets the most important part here and um, says that Regal mentioned that if the king sent you or Lady Time, it would be to poison my brother so that I might be the sole heir to the Mountain Kingdom. And Fitz tries to deflect this. He understands perfectly, but he's like, ah, you speak too fast. Um, I don't understand at all. And again, this is another blow to him. Where he's like, I don't really know how to respond to this because this is a straight on confrontation. Mm -hmm. And he said, I hope my smile did not look as dizzy and sickly as I suddenly felt. Right. Which maybe starting to kick in. Maybe it's just his uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like awkward, like confrontation. A little bit of both. Maybe a little bit of both. And then she says, I am sorry, but you speak our language so well, almost like a native, almost as if you were recalling it rather than learning it new. 
and then says, yeah, Regal, some, like over a month ago, Regal came to my chambers. He asked if he might dine alone with me, that we might get to know one another better. Like again, girl, call an Uber, get out of that date. <laughs> yeah. It's not a fun time. And also sad. Say you have to go smith something, yeah. like urgently. Uh-oh, I there's, know. I left Emergency. the iron on, <laughs> gotta go. <laughs> but yeah, like, that little revelation there, like, oh... It's almost as if you were recalling it instead, mm -hmm. which he is. Yeah. First time around, I didn't really catch that. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. He's really good with languages, like he said before. <laughs> so I was just like reading it and it's like, yeah. oh, this is a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> the next, you know, few times we read it, I'm like, mm hmm, fits. Yeah. Real quick with languages, huh? <laughs> Especially the one you spoke for six years. Yeah, for real. Then we're busts out and calls Ketrickin back and he's like, hey, Regal's asking that you would come with, um, come and meet the lords and ladies. And John Quee comes out as well. So all three of these people know that Fitz has been alone with Ketrickin for a while and that he is the poisoner. They don't know what she did to him, though. Right. Um, because that's revealed later that, like, she didn't tell them until, like, dawn. <laughs> after, like, the night. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a wave, an unmistakable wave of dizziness hits Fitz. And he's like, John Quee looks too knowing. And this is his paranoia right here. He's like, oh, I, I definitely got poisoned because they thought I was here to kill somebody. They all know and they were in on it. Like, this is, I think, yeah. his paranoia. They don't actually know that this happened. Right. Um, but he's like, oh, yeah, John Quee looked too knowing. <laughs> and... They're, like, all talking amongst one another as they, like, watch him leave later and stuff like that. It's just, like, his mind kind of in overdrive. Right. Uh, but he he declines, like, graciously and is trying to be very composed on the outside of, mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm, I'm very weary. I'm going to go back to my rooms. Right. He's using his training mm -hmm. um, to not show that he's been poisoned. Right. So he leisurely walks back to his, his like, little tent um, enjoying the garden so far while pain is racking his stomach right now. Mm -hmm. And also, like, if he's getting, like, sharp pains and dizziness, how is Three Leaves a merciful grave? Right? Like, this is... Maybe if he would have waited any longer, he would have just fallen asleep or something. Like, yeah, maybe you curl just... up and the pain just makes you pass out and then you die. True. And so he excuses himself, he walks away. Three of them watch him go and spoke softly together of what we all knew. Um, so he's very paranoid that they're all like, oh, we just poisoned him. Ha 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 ha. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure Rurisk and Jonquy and Ketrikan were just discussing him. Right. Like, and just like what the conversation was. Yeah. And I'm sure they know Ketrikan and assumed that she was a little abrasive about yeah him being a murderer probably like hey what'd you say what'd to you him say like you have, <laughs> Why to be, he hang out? you have to be nice to our guest sister <laughs> like come on <laughs> um but then fitz miraculously has this sea purge on him it's so weird yeah it's almost like someone with prescience knew what was gonna come <laughs> from a dream or something and know. gave you something to save your life <laughs> i guess we'll never know <laughs> Uh, but he's also wondering, you know, it, it definitely came through the honey cakes that they fed us, because that's the thing that I would have chosen. He didn't think that Ketrikin would literally feed him three leaves that uh -huh. were the poison, because um, he's crushing a little bit, first also, of all. I don't think but. he thought somebody so pretty could trick him. <laughs> he's like, I'm too smart for that. I wouldn't be caught slipping with also, Ketrigan. he was probably told and trained, I mean, because he's a professionally trained assassin, mm -hmm. don't feed them poison with your own hand. Right. Like, <laughs> if they get a bunch of pain in their stomach, they're going to know who fed them the poison. <laughs> so that's probably, yeah. Guess that's not always the case. <laughs> also, though, what was her plan? Like, he's just going to die and nobody's going to know who did right? it? Like, I think that's discussed in the next chapter, too. Like, Roros comes in like, hey. Are you you're alive? Yeah. How you doing, bud? Oh my, oh my god! <laughs> kind of like reprimands her. He's like, no idea what she was thinking about doing, but <laughs> please don't kill me because yeah. what she did. <laughs> um, so he takes this purge and uh, 
cleanses his whole body and spends a miserable night doing right. that. And luckily, um, he doesn't dwell on it. Yeah, he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't dwell on it. Uh, walks out, finds clean water, and drinks till he's bursting. Eventually finds some fruit and stashes a bunch because he's just going to eat that fruit for the rest of the trip there. Right. And the meat and, and the tack and stuff that he has down on his horse. Um, Because he's scared now of anything that he could possibly eat. Right. Thinking that they're just going to try to keep killing him. Mm-hmm. Um, he asked for, or he said yes to them sending wine in the middle of the night mm-hmm. uh, for him. And that never came. So he's like, oh, they're just going to wait till dawn to check on me to make sure I'm dead. Mm-hmm. So he's, like, terrified during this night because, one, he doesn't know if he's going to fully survive if he purged soon enough. He right. thinks he is. He right. thinks he's going to be fine. But he doesn't know this poison. He doesn't poison. know for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then what happens when they come to check on him if he's dead or not? Like, if he's alive, what are they What are they going to do to him? Yeah. Like, are they going to come checking with knives or? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So... Yeah, he wondered what else they would try when they found the poison hadn't worked. So now he's just living kind of in fear of the future. Yeah. Started off like a like an awesome little adventure chapter here yeah. and then ends with a <laughs> ends with Fitz huddled in a corner watching all sides like a maniac, yep. wondering when the next death blow is going to hit. Shaking from weakness. Mm-hmm. It's a fun chapter, for sure. I love learning more about Ketchikan because I really like Ketchikan as a, as a character. Right. And I love Rurisk. Yeah. Um, I'm so sad. Like, I'm more sad that he dies than Chivalry dies because we get to see Rurisk. True. And he's such a level-headed, intelligent guy. He's so cool. And he's so cool. Like, ah, uh, yeah. It's such a shame what happens. But Right. So, yeah, Fitz has Fitz is made his... <laughs> made a little trip to the mountain kingdom and uh, learns that he's outed as a poisoner. <laughs> not not fun times for our little Fitzy boy. Yeah. The native language comes back pretty easily, though. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you have any comments to share about any of the things that transpired or whatever. You want to talk about how you also love Barbie movies? You know, whatever, <laughs> whatever you all want to do. Or what prints you're most attracted to. Also that we can do a ranking scale. Let's talk about it. <laughs> we can do any of the characters. It doesn't just have to be the princes. We can True. put them all on a scale. True. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you for uh, listening this week. Yeah. We have a lot of fun making these and we really appreciate all the support that we've been getting. Please hit us up at uh, any of our social medias. Is Fitz Happy? Or email us directly, isfitshappy at gmail.com. And we hope that you always stay with us as long as you want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And before we get into some um, comments and emails that we got, I just want to give a quick congratulations to Buckkeep Radio. Yeah. A, I know we mentioned them before, but it's another podcast that is going through, um, obviously, another podcast about <laughs> the Farseers and uh, Realm of the Elderlings. They're going through all of the uh, the books, and they just finished up the Live Ship Traders. So please yeah. check them out. It's awesome. They've been going for a full year. Yeah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to them. Yeah. <laughs> And then we got a couple uh, couple emails, couple messages. Hey, right. I want to shout out Alex, Allison, and Elizabeth for giving us really cute uh, pet pictures. <laughs> uh, we love them. <laughs> um, we had some cats and dogs. Very, very cute. Not all named after characters in the book, but all super adorable. Yes. We also got um, an Insta message from... Allison, mm-hmm. um, asking if we think Desire truly loved Shrewd, basically. Yeah, and I, I think that she liked him, but more liked the power that he brought, right, as a king rather than like the man himself. I don't know. I feel like maybe she liked him until he didn't give her the power she wanted. Um, or maybe she just played him and knew she was hot and used that to her advantage. True. I mean, 
nothing wrong with that except for the fact that she's a horrible person so <laughs> <laughs> but i don't know i'm not 100 percent convinced that she did love him but i wouldn't be surprised if she started out having a crush on him at the very least he yeah. can't be ugly all of his kids are hot so <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it also is, um, she also brought up, like, why was it acceptable for um, her to have a bastard in Galen, mm-hmm. and Fitz wasn't really accepted at all. And we kind of touched on the fact that, at least that we think, that because Galen was so secret, like such a secret, mm-hmm. he was kind of, like, known in the royal family, but no one else outside knew and they had to keep appearances and Mm -hmm. the way that chivalry stepped down and how Fitz was so close to being next in line for um the kingship and queen desire wasn't really um queen when she had galen i don't think right like she was never in line for any throne yeah so it just kind of all culminates in like yeah there's a difference in how illegitimate children that are royals are treated but Fitz is such a unique case in where if he was recognized he would be very close to next in line Mm -hmm. or at least you know in the running yeah and his existence makes his father step down from the royal line yeah it's not like such controversy surrounding Fitz himself that right it's not just any other person it's chivalry making a mistake so Definitely a unique case. But yeah, but we definitely agree with Queen Desire manipulating everybody, yes. including Shrewd. <laughs> For sure. And then finally, on Facebook, Joel was letting us know that he thinks later um, in another book that it says that the original sacrifice of Jean Pei. Yeah, that Judge Prophet. Mm-hmm, might have been a catalyst for a white prophet. Um, which makes more sense than a rogue white (laughs) taking over. Because they kind of have that, like, urge to find their catalyst and affect change with their catalyst. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense. Right. And also, I mean, he he could have just been, or she, I guess. We don't know if the sacrifice is... The, uh, The original prophet judge was a woman. Okay, right. She could have just been of light skin and stature because that's kind of how the mountain people are they all seem to have blonde hair blue eyes yeah exactly um so it partially could be described as the way she was because she was of lighter skin yeah definitely but uh yeah we'll have to keep an eye out for that as well um there's a lot of things about the the whites and the prophets and their catalysts and stuff that appears in the last trilogy Mm -hmm. and i really need to dive into that again to um get a better picture in my mind to remember some more stuff you've read it more recently than i have right and so it's more fresh in my mind but also i found it so interesting i feel like i just soaked a lot more of it up yeah i really enjoy the idea of the whites being a race i don't know i just like it a lot i'm really curious as to like what they were like because there's no true whites anymore. Right. Like, Fool is, what, like, one thirty second white or something like that? It's, like, yeah. very diluted bloodlines. Mm-hmm. And he still lives a super long time. Yeah. And, I'm well, just Prill really Cop, curious. Prill... Prill Cop? Prill Cop? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Prill Cop is a pure white, right? He is more pure. I don't think he's actually pure white. Mm. But he is more pure than yeah they keep getting more diluted as the years go on right but i i remember hearing that there were no true whites left right and it's interesting that but he would be closest right and i think the whole thing is that whites aren't really going to be a thing anymore yeah and that they're the earth is just going to have to learn to spin without them or something Mm -hmm. i don't know i felt like that was the overarching message of that series but well, that's a, that's a long ways away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> years and years. Yes. It's just my favorite topic. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much for uh, tuning in again. We like hearing from you guys. It's really nice. Thank you.